lightning degenerates and dirtbags welcome back to another edition of the, the arbiters go to the movies i'm jp arbiter and with me as a special guest you know him from our mass effect playthrough welcome captain jack hello um and we are going to be talking about the seminal sci-fi trashic <laughs> i think is the best way to put it no no that's fair it's classic it's classic trash it uh is. dune Indeed. From uh, p from the the nineteen eighty four uh, oh directed by Stephen Lynch was it Yes Stephen yes. Lynch and if you watch the movie you have no question on who directed it <laughs> <laughs> I mean th this is the same no it was David Lynch David Lynch not Stephen Lynch my Okay, well, it was David Lynch. Lynch. Somebody. It was David Lynch who did Twin Peaks. So. Yeah, it's so the we're, same person. So we're used to uh, to do uh, hippie, hippie, trippy garbage from him. Um, so I, I I have to ask, and as a uh, as a newcomer to the Arbiters, go to the movies. You, we we often talk first about our experiences uh, with the subject matter in question. Mm. So, I mean, what what what's your history with Dune? Okay, so my history with Dune is a little is probably a little weird um, in the sense of, of course, it comes from a book, but I never read the book. Um, I have since read the book, but I did not read the book before seeing the movie, um, and I hadn't even heard of the book before seeing the movie. And the fact of the matter is, is that I saw the movie. Um, uh, it popped up when I was stationed overseas and living overseas. It popped up on um, AFN, <laughs> of all things, uh, I believe. Now, don't you know? Um, don't quote me on that necessarily. I do know that I watched it for the first time when I was stationed overseas, um, and I am uh, just making a leaping assumption that it was on AFN, but it could have been on like Sky or, or one of the other channels that we had <laughs> at that time, because uh, this would have been uh, nearly, probably closer to 30 years ago now um, when I first saw this uh, uh, wonderful dumpster fire, is how I would describe it. So for for me, um, I, I remember, th I remember this because it, it it was like a bad trip for me. I got pneumonia um, when I was like 10, 11 years old, and so I was sitting on a couch, stacks of bowls of cheap ramen soup because that was the only thing that I could eat eat because my throat was so swollen. Mm -hmm. And it's weird when I get sick, I get hungry. So, and I'm high on coating cough syrup at this point. Oh, the good stuff. And Back I, in the day when we could get the good stuff. And my mom said, you, you know, you, you know, my mom was saying, hey, you should try and get some sleep. And, and, and I was like, I really can't. I hurt too much, even with the coating cough syrup. I, when, you, when, when you can't, when, when coating doesn't put you down... It's bad. <laughs> Fair. So she said, all right, I've got the perfect movie that'll knock your ass out. It is that boring. Um, hmm. Well, she was talking to a 10-year-old. Well, I mean, understandably. So, so I think that she realized that it wouldn't be quite to my taste. Well, she was right. <laughs> it was boring especially for a 10 year old i still find it kind of boring today it's just that there's moments of it where where uh <clears throat> that that are golden um i like to think of it as uh, but but the thing is is that because because the the sickness because pneumonia and mm -hmm. being high on codeine over was overtaking me i still didn't sleep so Which i watched this movie high which is ironically funny because I think that uh, Lynch wrote it high, I think that uh, or directed it high at least. Um, it was the eighties. Everyone was on cocaine. It's true. It's very true. So, but but the th but uh, but the thing is, is that I watched it all in this weird haze of coding and exhaustion. And I'm not entirely certain how you could tell the difference between watching it uh, sober, but okay. Um, so anyway, of course, time went on. I 
grew older and my tastes evolved and I became that, uh, you know, that college snob that was really trying to get laid a lot. It was like, <laughs> Dune is the seminal science fiction masterpiece. It should be taught in literature classes in high school and colleges everywhere. <laughs> I mean, the book, maybe. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> it was the book, because since then I had read the book. Right. Um, and it was, uh, and like I said, it was my way of trying to be mm-hmm. the impressive snobby intellectual, and it worked. So <laughs> can't fault you there. So um, there were also there was a second attempt at the at making this. Uh, it was a oh, Sci-Fi yes. Channel miniseries yes, yes, with yes. Robbie Coltrane as uh, Vladimir Harkonnen. Yeah, it, uh, you know, uh, and um, it's still a dumpster fire. Yeah, mind you. Um, it's just, uh, quite possibly a, uh, a better looking dumpster. Well, it, it, <laughs> what it is, is that it was a larger dumpster, mm. you know, yeah. the, this, I, I <clears throat> the, the 1984 movie is a movie that is very much a fan of the freaking lifestyle, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's waiting around in, in trash. It's waiting around in trash. It's waiting around in a dumpster because... You can occasion because you it it is in Hollywood or it's in Las Vegas or wherever. Occasionally, you'll find you'll hit pay dirt. You'll find like truffles. Yeah, Dune. No, I get you. Dune is like yeah, yeah. trash truffles. Yeah. No. So with, with those moments of just pure joy that uh, that come in with the uh, uh, with the movie. That's fair. Um, but but the thing is is that the eighty four Dune is one of those dumpsters that has a trap that has the hydraulic trash compactor. So it's getting all of that garbage into one compressed space. Mm. The sci-fi series is one of those dumpsters from 1-800-GOT-JUNK that is just this long metal tray. Indeed. That you just haul away. And it's open and it's open topped. It's not closed or anything. So everyone can appreciate the smell of the trash. Well, you know, I mean, the sci-fi... And I remember watching it when it first came out on sci-fi, back when sci-fi had science fiction uh, shows um, and not reality TV. Or uh, remember when they tried to have a SmackDown on sci-fi? I do. I do. It was it was disturbing. Or it wasn't SmackDown. It was uh, what eventually would become NXT. Uh, I don't remember what they had on there, but I do remember they had uh, professional wrestling on there. I just uh, remember that at the time that that came out on sci-fi, sci-fi really was science fiction television. It was really putting out, and, and it had put out some entertaining stuff. This was not it. Uh, <laughs> this was... Uh, yeah, but it was it was not better, but it was not worse either than the original <laughs> movie. Uh, I have to say, uh, I I found it. Uh, it was, you know, it was the early two thousands, and we thought this was the best quality we could get out of very esoteric content. Well, I think um, there's a certain in the old style, so. Looking at things from an actor's perspective and from a performer's perspective, in the old style of how they used to do movies and how they used to produce and used to put things together for movies, um, I I think the the thought that Dune was uh, unfilmable is uh, 100% true. Mm -hmm. I think it's 100% true that it was unfilmable. I mean, they did it, so obviously it was filmable, but um, it, it, it didn't... You know, it didn't uh, grasp, it had none of the feeling of the book, it had none of the um, uh, pathos of the book, it had none of the um, kind of what made the book uh, what it was. Which, which, when you boil it down, the book was, I don't want to say it was an environmentalist story, but it was an ecological story. I think you could. I think an argument could be made for it being an environmentalist story. I think uh, uh, Hubbard intended it to be um, at least partially, at least somewhat, an environmentalist uh, story. Um, but definitely, an, uh, but uh, but I would definitely agree with you that it is most certainly uh, an ecology. Uh, it, it's a study well, of yeah. of wildlife and how everything, including humanity, stacks on top of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, so, and the damage that uh, humanity's uh, uh, exploitation of the uh, environment can rot. Yeah. 
So, um, there was one last bit of, uh, Dune, or, well, two last bits of, uh, Dune attempts. Now, the sci-fi series, like, it was, what, it was still, it was still trash, but it got enough following, somehow, to merit a sequel series with James McAvoy. Oh, yes. As Leto the Second. Indeed. Um, and the less we say about that, the better, because I did watch that one intentionally high. And that was about the only way I could digest it. Um, as a performer, uh, I, I cringe when I watch both of them, to be honest with you. Um, uh, mainly because of the uh, Renaissance Fair uh, style acting that they um, partake in. Not that I have a problem with Renaissance acting, I the, the rather sha- love it. it. It's almost Shakespearean overacting. Like yeah. like, like, yeah. You, like yeah. in the days of the Grand Old Opry, sort mm-hmm. of... Uh, and then the uh, the constant uh, fourth wall breaking and talking to the audience oh. uh, is is somewhat off putting as well. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, I mean none of them have been in any way, shape, or form great cinema. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I refer to all of them, regardless of how much I like them, as dumpster fires. <laughs> and we will have mere days as of the time of recording. Before we get to witness the latest iteration of the dumpster fire, oh, yeah. and the uh, it, yeah, and, and let's be, and let's be honest, and you 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 openly worship the man when uh, in our Mass Effect playthrough, you're probably in it just for Jason Momoa. Absolutely, as is most people that are going to go watch it. Um, <laughs> but that being that being said, from the trailers, it does look like they have put significant effort into at least making it look good. Um, uh, which I think the people uh, that have done it in the past have not done or did not do. Um, uh, 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 Although they may have thought they did. (laughs) I mean... Yeah. I mean... (laughs) I mean, the first one was visually um, uh, uh, disturbing on, on a lot of different levels. Um... And, and did not match uh, anything that I pictured in my head upon reading it. Uh, you know, um, which, of course, is the, uh, I guess, the uh, pitfall of, of doing that sort of thing, which is <laughs> of making a book into a uh, film, uh, which seems to be kind of popular right now uh, as far as... Um, uh, uh, Hollywood is star for low-cost... Um uh, pitches in the um, in the uh, uh, I don't want to call it television anymore, but in the the series with your Netflix and your and your HBO and and those sort of things for running you know Game of Thrones and then uh, uh, different ones like that. Which you know, looking into the future, if this movie bombs, which we have every uh, 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 honestly we have every <laughs> expectation of it bombing, despite the stellar cast. Mm-hmm. Just based on the uh, uh, dumpster fires that have come before it, um, we have every you know reason to believe that this one will bomb. Uh, a, a, uh, an honest uh, take might work as a um, you know longer running television series, since really one of the things that has caused it to bomb, crash and burn <clears throat> is the fact that it is such a long, expansive book trying to be shoved into two, three hour time. To say nothing of the myriad of novels, most of which these days post-date Frank Herbert's life. Uh, yeah, most of them are being written by his son, I want to say. Or by people his son hired. Exactly. Um, I think that, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, your, your, your original series, I think it's four books that were written by um, <laughs> uh, Hubbard, um, four or five, I forget, um, are uh, tell a pretty compelling story, but it, it's uh, you know it's one of those things where um, much like with all good science fiction, mm-hmm. there's there's room for more. Yeah, you see my arg- <clears throat> my argument, and we'll talk about this more in our in our last segment is is that forget live action. This needs to be adult animation. Oh, like a Ralph Bashi? No, well. I would actually, just to add the level of surrealness to it all, I would go for the same animation style as, like, Archer 
or or that uh, in or uh, that Amazon superhero series Invincible. No, that's fair. I think um, that I, I no, I see where you're going with that, and I I don't necessarily I can't I don't have a disagreement on that. I think that that is a uh, um, that's a fair idea. I think it'd still be a dumpster fire. I, I mean, honestly, I think that the uh, and and do do not take the fact that I call this a dumpster fire the fact that I don't like it. I absolutely love it. Uh, <laughs> I, I do. I love the dumpster fire that it is. I love standing by the heat of the dumpster fire and warming my hands, um, <laughs> and and cooking my popcorn on the uh, uh, horror, horror that is this series of uh, Dune movies that have been made. Um, <laughs> I admire every single actor that has had to utter a single word within any of these. The spice melange. The, yeah, <laughs> any actor that has had to it has my uh, deep admiration for uh, even uh, even being brave enough to make the attempt. For being brave enough to get inside that dumpster. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well. Speaking of which, I think we've held it off long enough. Shall we dive into the dumpster? Oh, let's just dive on in. We begin, rather abruptly, staring into the abyss. And the abyss starts staring back at us. A disembodied head gives us a whole bunch of exposition, indicating that the movie takes place 10,000 years, give or take, from the present day, on a Tuesday. We're always on the Tuesday. <clears throat> the known universe is ruled by an emperor, and everyone is tripping balls on a drug called Spice Melange, which is only found on one planet called Palace Isra... Arrakis. Arrakis. Anyway, the princess of the universe feels like she's been talking for several hours, but Apple TV's run timer has assured me it's only been a couple of minutes before mm. we get the title sequence. This is Dune. The planet is Arrakis, also known as Dune. On the Emperor's home world of uh, Cajun, or Cadian, I, I can't pronounce this uh, crap, Devo comes from its recording of Whip It Good uh. and departs a spaceship to ask the Emperor, hey, what's going on? Yeah. Uh. And I said, hey, yeah, 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 hey, yeah, yeah. I said, hey, what's going on? And uh, just keep that idea in your head as you're going through this, because that's going to be <laughs> what you're thinking um, the entire time. Map paintings, by the way, are everywhere. In the background, as is the ostentation of the uh, uh, of the throne room of the emperor, complete with royal dog walkers. Why those are there among the hustle and bustle of oh my god, get ready, Devo is coming, is beyond me. Uh, and and it's not like one or two; it's like a dozen dogs. I, I I'm obsessed with these dogs. Dude loves his dogs. I mean, I mean. Queen Elizabeth loves her corgis, but she only has, like, three. It's true, but she could have more. <coughs> if she wanted. I mean, she's... I mean, for, forget the fact that she's the Queen of England. It's Betty. I'll let her do anything she wants. Facts. <laughs> the Emperor clears the room as a black Winnebago rolls in, escorted by Devo, who demands the Emperor's truth-sayer leave. She does so willingly and takes a seat in the adjacent room, but continues to snoop in using her psychic powers. The Winnebago opens up and a giant floating sperm moves forward and speaks to the Emperor. Appar mm. Apparently, while navigating space, he can also see into the future somewhat and demands to know, hey, what's going on? <laughs> We're not going to sing that again. No. Typical royal politics seems to be the order of the day, as the Emperor is ordering a transfer of power from House Harkonnen to House Atreides over the planet Arrakis, which is the only source of spice in the universe to run on. Get used to hearing the phrase, the spice must flow. Indeed. And this is one thing that, with Dune, with all of the Dune stories that I don't get, 
spice apparently is completely unable to be synthesized, mm-hmm. and that's why this planet is um, it is so important. Clearly, the German people have been exterminated 10,000 years in the future, because you give a bunch of German engineers an unlimited supply of cigarettes and seal them in a in a airtight aquarium and they will accomplish anything i you know i can't uh, argue against that i i most, do know most of the synthetic latex that we use today was created by german engineers because there was a rubber shortage during the first world war now i do know that um in in the case of this this uh, uh, story, they do in fact explain about the spice. Um, I also know that they don't in explain. the movie <laughs> at all. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, after ordering deniability, after ordering deniability to the emperor, because apparently the emperor still answers to people, the sperm whale thing gets put into the back of the Winnebago, closed up, and Devo rolls out. And we get our first of many inexhaustible internal monologues asking why the Navigators Guild wants Paul Atreides, the son of Duke Leto Atreides, killed. The Bene Gesserit Witch, no explanation as to who, what that means. Nope. <clears throat> uh, sen- None whatsoever. Sends her agents to find out. So... Which is kind of a theme in this in the movie is a lot of things that are over explained in the book are not. On Chaldean, a planet most unlike Arrakis in that it has oceans. Mm. Actually, it seems to have nothing but oceans and a few archipelagos. <clears throat> we get to we get some voiceover about these bald women trying to produce some Uber mensch. It is not really important though. And we are reintroduced to Paul Atreides, who is played by Kyle MacLachlan, whom you might remember from a Justice League movie where he voiced Superman. Uh, you also might what? remember him from Agents of the Shield, where he played Mr. Hyde, although they didn't call him that in the show. Uh, he was also one of the gal's boyfriends in Sex of the City. Not sure which one. It may have been multiple. And of course, because... Uh, of, I believe this is the first time they worked together, and they worked together uh, uh, going forward quite a few times. Uh, he was in Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. Oh, and my favorite role of his, just because it's so stupid and over the top, he played the employer of uh, Lily uh, in How I Met Your Mother, the ah. ca- the captain, the guy who was obsessed with boats and loved his uh, and loved his uh, maid singing to him. Yes, he did. Good morning, Captain. Hello, ladies. <clears throat> anyway. We're establishing that he's an odd fellow, and he plays odd roles. Yep. That's really what we're going with. Yep. Anyway, and he is so odd that he plays the Exposition Finder app on his iPad, explaining the state of politics about House Atreides, House Harkonnen, Arrakis, uh, Kalyan, uh, the... Uh, the uh, House Harkonnen's Throne World of Getty Prime, uh, yada, yada, yada. But he is rudely interrupted when three men walk in. There's Thufur and his eyebrows, played by Freddie Jones. <laughs> There's U- Dr. Yue, played by Dean Stockwell, who mysteriously talks to no one in particular right next to him. Ah, yes. See what I did there? I see. I see what you did there. And, and then it's really the, hard not to think that with him and in that, everything that he does. And then there is the most fantastic overactor of them all in this entire movie. Gurney, played by Patrick goddamn Stewart. I see, I knew you were gonna bring that up, and I and obviously you have to. Uh well, we when talk you're dealing cast. with uh, uh, the cast and you're dealing with uh, uh, Patrick Goddamn Stewart. Um who is, you know, a a just a treasure. For the human, for all of humankind, um, and and let's keep in mind this is pre Star Trek: The Next Generation. Patrick Stewart, most Americans were familiar with Patrick Stewart from either a brief role as uh, as Uther Pendragon Seneschal 
in Excalibur. Yeah. Or if they manage to get get like videotapes of Shakespearean stage performances from England. Indeed. Absolutely. So, you know, it, this is kind of the first time most people see this fella. And uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. And really, I gotta be honest with you, his uh, acting kind of fits. Well, it's very <laughs> much Royal Shakespeare Company. The, uh, the whole piece, uh, to be honest <coughs> with you, uh, I'm... Uh, I can't uh, uh, fault him in that way. Uh, and it gets better. It does. Like, not, and, and when I say it gets better, I mean it gets weirder. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Fulfer's eyebrows berate Paul for keeping the back, his back to the door and the door open. But Paul says he's that damn good that he could hear him walking in when they rounded the corner. <laughs> Patrick Stewart says he is going to kick Paul's ass and pulls a knife and and opens an energy shield. Paul responds in kind and eventually corners Gurney, using slow, deliberate movements to bypass a shield. When we say slow, deliberate, we, we mean, really mean slow and deliberate. <laughs> Patrick Stewart points out that his movements also put Paul in danger, showing his knife down down at Paul's side. And Paul says, doesn't matter, I still beat you. <laughs> now keep this in mind, folks, because this is going to, this is, this is in the uh, entertainment or in the performance, what we call foreshadowing. <laughs> so after some more education, the men ask for a demonstration of Paul's proficiency with the first thing that is made up exclusively for the movie, the weirding module. <laughs> yes. See, this monstrosity. <laughs> now, for those who are familiar with the book, there is no weirding module. There is no sound cannon. There, there's no nothing. The w instead, instead, there's this like weirding way, which is a combination of like Jedi powers and like Tai Chi. Yeah, that, that's what it's supposed to be. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, I I could uh, there, you can go into a big long explanation of it that you get out of the books, but, but it's it's, well, it's it's super Jedi martial arts. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's. And instead, that gets all reduced to a sound cannon. It's self-important because shown very briefly, but never quite explained, projectile weapons that use traditional gunpowder have become completely outmoded in this universe. Mm -hmm. Directed energy weapons exist, but are fucking dangerous. Yeah, and again, that's another thing that gets explained that in 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 the books that is not, not explained in as far as I remember in any of the film uh, adaptations. Uh, but but the whole thing is, is that you have the you you have these personal shields that we see, and they only allow slow moving objects in. So if you are using ranged weapons, you're reduced down to like spring loaded projectiles right or you have to use knives Which um is, uh, you know and and you know well it's the future where are my laser phaser guns well as it turns out if you shoot a laser phaser gun at, at someone with a shield you could blow them up you could blow yourself up or you could blow both of you up something's getting blown up is what yeah. we're, we, yeah. is what we're saying because it just like disrupts space time or some shit frank herbert was weird yeah that's essentially what it is he wanted to create a world where where people had to fight with knives and i mean this is a, a kind of a trope of sci-fi really when you think about it is this idea that yeah we have this high technology but we have to come up with some reason for people to actually like fight with their hands um and of course that's a, that's another thing that happens in uh, any kind of film sci-fi <coughs> because um you know uh laser fights are boring are boring uh as opposed to uh somebody <coughs> trying to, two people trying to stab each other uh which is which is uh, apparently not boring uh um well lord knows i get off on it or or uh is not supposed to be boring um <laughs> this this movie in fact proves otherwise <laughs> anyway so so they fire up call of duty on the brass 
Pillar 5000, and Paul kicks so much ass he just presses Y to skip. So, we cut to the we cut to men marching down a hallway that was apparently designed by H.R. Giger, and Paul says hi to the greatest character in the series, Duncan Idaho. Duncan Idaho. He is so great that he is, I mean, th this he's the best character. He's the best. Uh, he is the best in uh, in every iteration. Except this one. Except this one. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, we are meant to infer a brotherly relationship between he and Paul. That is correct. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's just so much fondness and, you know, hey, yeah, it's sort of like Biggs in Star Wars. Yep. You know, they see each other and they're excited and mm -hmm. yada, yada, yeah. yada. And then what happens to Biggs? He gets blown the fuck up. <laughs> it's true. So, um, but we had to make room for Wedge Antilles. It's true. It's so, also true. So, anyway, after after uh, so, some high-fiving and, hey, I'll see you, I'll see you dirt side, Paul meets his mother, Jessica, played by Francesca Anise. Who internal monologues while letting the Bene Gesserit uh, witch from, of the Emperor in. The first thing the Elder Witch does is berate Jessica, seemingly 20 years too late, about Paul's birth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, we're, we're, we're past all of that. You gonna chew me out now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know... It, it, it. <coughs> A little late for that kind of a chewing out, but, you know, what are you going to do? So, anyway, um, but apparently one of the many vaguely defined powers that the Bene Gesserit have, and Jessica is one of them, is in vitro gender selection. Yes! Yeah. And she was supposed to have a daughter, and that was supposed to lead to arranged marriages, and yada, 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 yada. Yeah, because they were really into uh, husbandry. Well, of the human race. Well, and they were trying to breed that ubermensch sort of individual. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> with a name that uh, very difficult to pronounce. Yeah, that's why I say ubermensch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Accomplishes the same thing. Um, Jessica responds with, what you gonna do about it? And Paul is summoned by the bald woman, who we learn finally, half an hour in, that her name is Mother Gaius, played by Helen Moheim. But I'll keep calling her the bald woman. Speaking through the synthesizer of compulsion, plus two, she tells Paul to put his hand in her box while holding a knife to his neck. We find out that the box contains herpes. Uh, I have made that mistake a time or two myself. Well, Not with the herpes, but... Yeah. Well, you know, the itching, burning sensation. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. I'm sure there's more po pointless bullshit in this scene, but we're half an hour into a two-hour and 15-minute movie that I feel like I've been watching at, at this point for a couple of weeks. So, let's skip. We're going to skip to Getty Prime and watch an utter how utterly silly a movie like this can get, as there's a guy in a phone book who starts chanting to himself while drinking Hawaiian Punch. Ugh. Oh. God. Map paintings of the inside of a Borg cube take us to the chambers of Duke Vladimir Harkonnen, played by Kenneth McMillan and all ten tons of his ego. Ugh. Yes. This. If you want to see overacting at its absolute finest, Kenneth McMillan in Dune is it. You're not wrong. Uh... <laughs> I, I think I have seen, um, uh, I have seen in my lifetime, uh, I have actually done in my lifetime better, <laughs> but I don't think uh, uh, consistently a better performance uh, of uh, overacting has been given. Anyway, Duke Carconan apparently stuck his whole head into Mother Gaius's herpes box. The entire friggin' head. Because he is being treated for what I can only describe as the worst skin cancer I have ever seen. The man has the pox, is what we're saying. In addition to weighing about 800 pounds. In addition to. You know, meanwhile, his doctor is, like, loving the fact that he is basically playing Dr. Pimple Pop Popper 20 years before Dr. Pimple Popper was a thing on O-Network. True. 
Very Meanwhile, true. being attended by two nurses who had their ears and eyes sewn shut, so I'm wondering what good they are. Yeah, um, it's a very weird, uh, the whole setup is just bizarre. The weird dude with the Hawaiian punch lips informs the Baron, Baron that the Duke hates him back and that things get weird and wild from there. The Duke then calls in his, his nephews. The movie stops as Sting, in all of his radiant glory, his orange blonde spiky hair, and his reflective sweaty pallor, oh, comes onto screen, complete with his own guitar solo. Indeed. Oh my gosh. A, uh. a tight rubber suit adhering to his supple British body, hair freshly fueled and codpiece gleaming with the hard passionate manly love I want him to plow into my secret garden. <sighs> His brother Raban is there too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and the thing is is that uh, and looking back at it and knowing what I know now, Raban is is the more interesting character in a, a, a lot of different ways. Um, <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> but uh, uh, <coughs> but when you have Sting I mean, when you get Sting, who probably at the time was... <laughs> Looking the... off screen to the paycheck for this movie being the, tickled No, off very screen. true. But at the time, I would say Sting was probably the, well, the most well-known entertainer in this movie um, at that time. Uh, I think Sting was... I, honestly, I think Sting was the main draw for this movie at that time, which is saying something. The main draw? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to say it. Um, I said it, and I meant it, and I'm not taking it back. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm not paying attention to what exactly is being uh, spoken between the various characters right now. There's really because, no need to at this point. Because, there's a be because a beautiful androgynous being walks in, and the Baron takes notice almost as fast as I do, and things get kind of rapey. <sighs> yeah. Something about someone and Duke Leto, Leto's retinue being bought. Uh, the Duke, Duke Harko or excuse me, that. Uh, Baron Harkonnen flies uh, over, laughs, bathing in literal blood before moving to our beautiful boy and pulling a plug on his heart, forcing him to bleed to death. Everyone looks away, and I have the weirdest boner right now. It is it is a disturbing scene. Uh, Sting also has one. Yes, well, uh, uh, you know, according to him, you know, he has one all the time. Well, he just... <laughs> then why does he keep telling you not to stand so close to him? Uh, that's because he's got a damn boner all the time. Him and his tantric loving. Um, anyway... Swapping scenes, we're back to Paul, his dad Leto, and his dad's bitches as they board a ship heading for Arrakis. Thousands of ships rendezvous with Rama. Eh? Yeah. Uh, okay. No, I guess L you, little I guess too you, esoteric of a reference? Yeah, slightly. <laughs> slightly. But, but, you know, I mean, there'll be like five people that get that joke. Anyway. Um, <laughs> before a, the giant sperm from the beginning of the movie we saw a week ago, but Apple TV has assured me it was less than an hour at this point. It's true. He hawks a space loogie at two points equidistant from where he is standing, and the ship flies to Arrakis. Coming down from an acid trip, Rama appears above Arrakis, and we can finally watch the movie proper. Seriously, if you are keeping score, 45 minutes into the movie, and we can finally watch the movie. You, you, no, it's you're not wrong. We There's can, a lot of buildup to the actual events that go on I, in the movie. I should point out that in the movie Alien, the alien has finally popped out of, uh, or has popped out of Kane's chest 15 minutes ago. Yeah. No, I, so. I, I mean, look. I mean, it, I mean, that was a slow burn of a buildup. It's true. But and this is, it is uh, uh, a long, <laughs> drawn out, painful process, sort of like my first marriage. <laughs> um. So, 
Now that we can fi finally enjoy this movie, a woman with extremely blue eyes proclaims it as such. Mm -hmm. Duke Leto meets with Duncan goddamn Idaho, Duncan who, goddamn. Is who is sent uh, ahead and... and blah. Duncan Goddamn Ido, who was sent ahead of the Duke in order to make contact with the native Fremen of Arrakis. Duncan confides that he believes the Fremen are vast in number, more than the Imperials, uh, more populous than the Imperial colony on the world. We also learn that the Harkonnens sabotaged many systems when they left, including industrial uh, equipment being sabotaged and suicide bombers. Hmm. Duke, Leto, and Paul are given a briefing on a piece of de desert survival equipment called still suits, which distill wasted body water and purifies it in, for later consumption. The less said about that, the better. Yeah, yeah. You know, the question I get asked most often is, Tony, how do you go to the bathroom in the suit? Just like that. You can wander for weeks drinking your own tepid urine and sweat. <laughs> Which still sounds vaguely more enjoyable than spending time with my ex-wife. <laughs> Having met her, you were basically uh, drinking your own tepid urine and sweat. So. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Paul apparently put his on the right way, so says the Fremen guide that that was show that is showing them around. They fly out into the open desert. Overhead, they spot a desert worm moving towards one of the many spice harvesters. But the craft that moves the, the harvesters themselves is late in pulling them out. Duke Leto orders the ornithopter they are piloting to land and saves the mining crew, shocking his Fremen escort. Paul, meanwhile, seems to get a contact high as the worm spins swallows the entire spice crawler whole and patrick stewart gets a boner this by the way this is uh for those of you that don't know this is kind of a running gag with this movie uh well not a running gag well every just... everyone just kind of looks like they're, they're they 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 just finished that's where i was going with this is <laughs> they do they, and they deliver their lines accordingly <laughs> Meanwhile, it's revealed that Dr. Yue was the bought-off traitor among the Duke's uh, entourage as he finds a message hidden in the bones of a Harkonnen partisan. Mm. Paul goes to his bedroom and he takes a hunch, hunk of spice, which was expensive enough to buy a mansion built out of numerous smaller mansions. Pack your bags, kids, because we are going on a trip. His ride, however, is interrupted as a floating hypodermic needle full of Narcan comes to inject Paul. A Freeman servant walks into his room and the needle almost flies towards her. Paul grabs it and we see Linda Hunt, a fabulous character actress. Indeed. Who I always identify her, by the way, as the principal from Kindergarten Cop. And like, like that's what my brain uh -huh. defaults to. She's been in so many things of so much varying quality. And I, in my head, in my head canon, every single character has been Henrietta Lang from uh, NCIS Los Angeles. <laughs> um, like, every single one is just <laughs> aspects of her life that she has led as a Cold War spy. Um, uh, and is literally the most dangerous human on the planet. Um, <laughs> Anyway, Linda Hunt warns Paul that there's a traitor in the house of Atreides. Troops rip the place apart to find the would-be assassin who is se who turns up seemingly dead. The threat is gone and they raise their shields. Everything seems fine now. But everything is not fine now. Then it happens. UA has poison darted Duke Glado, ripped out one of his teeth, and filled the other one with poison gas revealing that he was bought only so he could strike at Baron Harkonnen directly. He vows to save Paul and Lady Jessica while reminding Duke Leto of the poison capsule that was just installed in his missing tooth. Meanwhile, all hell breaks loose as Baron Harkonnen and the Emperor's own Sadakar special forces strike down. Shredding Atreides opposition who are left defenseless with their new sonic weaponry set ablaze. 
Yeah. The Baron Harkonnen captures Jessica and Paul and gloats over them. And we get into full-on creep territory as he informs Jessica that he is going to spit on her face before he actually does so. Leaving her and Paul to the delicate hands of his Hawaiian punch addict who gets all rapey before lording, and lording over them before being hauled out of the desert as UA suggested. The thing that UA planned to assure that Paul and Jessica survive. As they are being hauled out, Duncan goddamn Idaho comes to save the day. He kills one shock troop before throwing up his personal shield and going full Orange Cassidy on an entire platoon down the stairs. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, so, now, being a product of its time, yeah. 1984, uh, this being before America had discovered uh, um, uh, actual uh, good-looking fights in mm -hmm. movies, uh, from uh, various sources, uh, <laughs> Hong Kong coming to mind. Um, this looked um, terrible. Um, <laughs> just, just awful. Just awful. He stabbed a motherfucker, rose his, raised his shields, and again, he basically jumped from the top rope on top of a bunch of people. He does. He does. And it, yeah. A tope suicida, I believe it is. I, I, I believe it is referred to as a tope suicida. Um, it and it is certainly suicida for Duncan Idaho because he gets shot by a dart gun. Indeed. Right uh, through the noggin. Uh, yep, right through the noggin. And, you know, the most, the most awesome character in this movie, less than two minutes of screen time, I think. I believe so, yeah. Uh, which is uh, which is another uh, <coughs> notch against this movie, since uh, uh, as awesome as he is, he is awesome throughout the whole story. Um, but uh, uh, this is all we shall see of him, sadly. <laughs> anyway, Ua is brought before Baron Harkonnen, who is smart enough to know not to leave a traitor in his miss, even though he bought him, and orders Ua stabbed in front of him. Wise. <clears throat> Making their escape through the uh, through the use of the synthesizer of compulsion, Paul and Jessica regain control of their bodies and convince one Harkonnen soldier to stab another before getting his own face kicked in. Despite losing a wing, Paul and Jessica make good their escape, ultimately crashing, having a close encounter with a worm, and being rescued by the Freeman. Meanwhile, Sting is practicing the BDSM techniques I want him to use on me, mm. engaging in erotic asphyxiation on Duke Leto, wishing it was Paul instead. The Baron and his Hawaiian punch addict come in for the for the Baron's promised gloating 500 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yes. In his drugged and beaten state, Leto confuses the Baron with the Hawaiian punch man, biting his tooth too soon and killing him in in an exhalation of what looks to be chlorine? It's kind of like this mustardy yellow? I, I would say chlorine gas uh, uh, or a similar substance. Uh, mustard gas, something along those lines. Yeah. Baron Harkonnen is shocked by the fact that he gets a, nearly a face full of the poison gas himself and sits in a stupor for about 20 years before a before one of his aides comes in and assures him he is still alive. He flies high and gloats to this fact. And at this point in the movie, I think that somebody should come in and assure us that we're still alive. Oh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, he's like, going, I'm alive and going like full Peter Pan around the room. It's gloriously cheesy. It is. It's absolutely gloriously yeah. cheesy. Oh, those wacky Harkonnens. Uh, indeed. So we have another hour of this movie or the entirety of year, the year 2020. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure which one is going to be more painful. Um, <laughs> I think it's about 50-50. So, but... Here's the other thing that happens, interestingly enough. The movie go for the remaining hour of this solid 60 minutes of movie, we go from things taking forever to making it feel rushed. It does. It, it's not rushed. Um, but I it think, feels but it rushed. it feels rushed. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. Um, it, is, uh, uh, it is painful. Um... It is uh, uh, the pacing is all over the place and is just 
ugly. Well, um, so anyway, Paul crashes his plane and goes on another spice trip, basically a flashback where he's... Uh, where he sees weird stuff, he sees a mouse, he sees, like, his future, I'm pretty sure there's a fetus in there? Um, I, well, it's a, uh, it, it, it is a, um, it is a navigator. Yeah. Um, which, um, again, they don't explain what those are. Um. <laughs> anyway, so, but they have to run, and they, and we hear the great line from Fatboy Slim, walk without rhythm and you won't attract the worm. Ah yes. While it, while an acoustic beacon is attracting a worm where they were, how do you walk without rhythm? Because even if you're like subconsciously walking without rhythm on a long enough measure, there's you still mean, rhythm. Yeah, there's still be rhythm. Um, I you know it's funny. Uh, I have no idea. Um, I'm white. I have no rhythm. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would like to say that uh, this is probably. The one in my mind, like truly saving grace, if there is any such a thing with this movie, which I don't believe that there is, but if there is, uh, the special effects with the worm is pretty ahead of its time. Oh yeah, I and and, and if you pay attention, it was a similar, uh, it, it was a similar model to the uh, the Dagobah in yeah. uh, in Return of the Jedi. Yeah. So. But, you know, Industrial Light and Magic basically has a monopoly on special effects in Hollywood at this time. So It's true. It's true. But it, it, but, the, but the worms look good, is what I'm saying. The worms look okay. Um, so, anyway, they run. They almost get eaten. But they don't. And then they encounter the Fremen. Indeed. Um, one Fremen tries to do a reverse uh, chicken wing choke hold, half chicken wing choke hold on Paul's mother, but she's uh, having none of that shit. None of it. And apparently because, like, apparently because she had none of it and, like, no one has ever had none of it with the Fremen before, they, like, start worshipping her immediately. It's true. And so they they promise, promise them sanctuary and they gave... Uh, Paul, two uh, two new names. They call they say among us you'll be called Usil, and in the public we'll refer to you as Muadib. Muadib. That's a very important uh, name. Uh, it's a kangaroo uh, mouse. Yeah, it's a it's a kangaroo mouse. Um, I was going to say there was some kind of import to it, but uh, th- there's much like everything else. Well, in this movie. there is nothing. Well, it's sort <laughs> it's sort of like the coyote in uh, in a lot of what uh, southwestern Native American. Uh, mythology, mm-hmm. yeah. This seemingly benign survivalist is important to the stories of of the Fremen. So, anyway, Paul then says, Paul and Jessica agree to teach them the special martial arts of the Benare Jesuit, including their special uh, synthesizer of influence thing, and they build new weirding modules. Those little sonic handheld sonic cannons. Um, we then get about a decade's worth of insurrection yep. against the Harkonnens reclaiming Arrakis and the brutal, uh, hand of Sting's brother, Raban. Mm-hmm. The uh, interesting com- Compressed into 20 minutes or so. I Just would say about 20 minutes. Fighting, yeah. A lot of fighting happens. Patrick Stewart's picked up again along the way. He's yep. been He's been out there surviving. He's been doing what Patrick Stewart does. And, Be awesome. <laughs> and meanwhile, Paul falls in love with Channy. Ah, uh, yes. Played by Sean Young. Indeed. Uh, and they get, you know, they fall in love and... Yada yada. Meanwhile, the Fremen's mystic, uh, shaman, holy woman, you, all of the pri- priestess dies, and Lady Jessica says, "I'll become your priest." And so she shaves her head and she drinks some antiseptic barbacomb water. Mm-hmm. And like apparently, because and, and then there's like this massive rave or orgy. Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think I think the proper answer to that is yes. Like, everyone... In the book, everyone licks her sweat off, which glows blue. Yes. And, like, there's a whole lot of fucking. 
Uh, yes, uh, far more fucking than is uh, uh, generally I, speaking. I was uh, invited accepted. for oyster diving, but instead everyone was having sex. It's true. It's very disturbing <laughs> uh, if that sort of thing disturbs you. It doesn't. But nah. <clears throat> so, but there's one person who ceases to have his acid flashbacks, and that's Paul, and he's concerned. Yes. So he says maybe you can I tell should because he makes a concerned face. Yes. So maybe I should drink the antiseptic barber comb water. No. No, don't do it, Paul. No. Don't do it. Paul, Why? Paul, Paul, if a man drinks it, it'll kill him. But what if it doesn't? Then you <laughs> then apparently you'll become God? It's, How come more people haven't tried this? It it it's only deadly if it kills me. <laughs> yes. So that's what deadly means. So Channy ties him up in the middle of the thing, he drinks his antiseptic barber comb water because that's what a thing looks like to me, kids. And he has a really, really, really bad trip. But he eventually recovers and proclaims, Father, the sleeper has awakened! And now he can summon sandworms seemingly at, at will and realizes that they are the source of the spice. The entire galactic economy runs on worm poo. That is correct. <sighs> So, dissatisfied with the ongoing insurrection, the Emperor amasses a huge invasion fleet to resolve the situation on Arrakis. He has Raban beheaded and then summons the Baron to, in order to have the Baron beg forgiveness. And he does. He says, please don't kill Raban. Look over in that corner. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Whoopsie! While, while remember this is not a kids movie folks yes while the uh while the entreaties for his life at this point continue paul and the fremen attack the emperor's ship and the and Iraq, and the main Arrakis compound almost as if this was their plan all along and i have to point out something very briefly mm. For that that happens in this whole attack. I mean, first off, they're riding worms. We got worm sign, the likes of which God hasn't seen. Yada yada yada. Yeah, yeah. But there's this one scene where they're looking down, as like, all right, we're ready to blow this this canyon wide open. Patrick Stewart shouts out, "Atomics!" implying they're going to detonate a nuclear bomb. Yes. And they put on. What I assume is a radiation suit. Mm -hmm. The bomb detonates. It blows a canyon wide open, wide enough for worms to just start going through. And none of that's going to make any sense to anyone, much like, oh, I don't know, everything, everything that Lynch has before. ever done. Um, but and then they immediately take the radiation suits off to say nothing of the fact that there were all those freemen raiding all of those worms that weren't protected yep. from the fallout or, I don't know, the massive multi-kiloton blast of that was <laughs> that was being detonated. And, blow, and blowing open a canyon, even with nuclear weapons, is not just something where you can just, like, jam the thing in... And let it do its thing. You gotta be very precise about where you want it. Demolitions is an art form. It's why there are experts for it. Ah. And as you have said, an art form. Something this movie is not. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they immediately... Patrick Stewart shouts out Atomics. They put on their fume hoods. We show a distinctly not nuclear looking explosion in the dark. Uh-huh. By the way, pitch black. And all of the while, and and worms start pouring through, and thus the emperor and his generals get, go onto a portion of their ship where there is a merry-go-round and a video yeah. game console built into one. Seriously, why is this spinning around when they're directing turrets? Why is that even a thing? It doesn't even look good. Lynch. And we finally get to see lasers being shot out while the Freemen are doing their thing, going wapa, wapa, wapa with their sonic guns. And, you know, children are screaming, worms are dying, people are dying, yada, yada, yada. And uh, my patience is dying. Yes. <laughs> well, we're, get, we're getting there. The end is in sight. 
So, anyway, eventually they take the ship and they take the capital, and it's all over, and we have to deal with the political aftermath of it. Because just because you win the war doesn't mean there aren't consequences. Truth. So, in a great big meeting, in a great big hall that I'm 90% sure we've seen somewhere in this movie, but I've long since forgotten. Mm, it was probably about a week ago, despite what uh, Apple TV tells us. <laughs> Uh, Paul confronts a defeated emperor <clears throat> and realizes that there is a Harkonnen among them. And we get to see Sting and Paul duke it out. This is true. And what, and what honestly, is A, a fantastic knife fight. It is. It's, it's probably <coughs> the best fight in the whole movie. <laughs> um, and ultimately... Sting reveals that he's got this weird, like, ho poison hook knife thing in his side. Yeah, it, like, pops out of his gut or his belt or something along those lines. It's very weird. And he's trying to put his hip into it because they're out of thing. And Paul says, okay, I'm just going to fall. Well, what happens if you stab him? I'm going to take that risk. Essentially. And Sting misses, and he winds up with a knife in his, like, right underneath his jaw and up through his brain. And then Paul shouts something with the synthesizer of compulsion, and there is an earthquake and a rainstorm, and Paul's sister, oh yeah, Paul has a sister. Yep. Uh, ends up... The weird uh, one. She's weird. Yeah. Ends up proclaiming him to be Jesus or something. The end. I will kill him! So, Captain. Yes. What do you think about this movie? I think this movie is quite possibly one of the worst movies ever made. Um, and I have been in film classes where it is assured to me that the official worst movie of all time is Plan 9 from Out of Space. I disagree with this. <laughs> vehemently. I think this movie is awful on levels that other movies and other things cannot be awful. I the thing about Plan 9 and the thing about Ed Wood was there was enthusiasm there. I believe that this movie is so awful that you cannot compare it to other movies that are awful. You have to compare it to other awful experiences. Because that's what this movie truly is, is an experience. Um, it is an experience of awfulness that will change your definition of awful. Uh, and so I think that this movie is so, so terrible. And yet, and yet, I never fail to watch it all the way through when it pops up. Most of the time, I, I mentioned that when they land on Arrakis, that's kind of when the movie actually starts. Starts, yeah. So, uh, so a lot of times I'll just skip to that. And, and that's a fair, I think that's a, a totally fair, and I think in a lot of ways that actually might make the movie better. It's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like, watchable. it's sort of like how kids will often say, can we get to the color part of the movie when watching The Wizard of Oz? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, but that's because kids are bastards and don't have an appreciation for art. It's true. Uh, much like this movie, which is a bastard and has no appreciation for art. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we can't save this movie. No, God, God, no. Um, <laughs> it's it's far. I mean, I was I was a year old when it came out. So. Yeah. Um. No, uh, actually, I was no, I was three years old. It was eighty six when it came out. Right. Eighty. I I want to say it was uh, it was something. It was either eighty four or eighty six. Yeah, it was somewhere in there. Um, I, and I think that uh, this movie. The story... No, it was 84. I was a year old. Uh, the story is uh, savable. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense of uh, this, this new movie that's coming out may actually work. And it may, and it may, um, it may uh, be a good movie. Do justice to the story. Um, however, this particular take on it, um, uh, much like my uh, first marriage, cannot be saved. Um, <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it could not be saved, and it cannot be saved. Um, and, and this is, you know, it's funny. Sometimes you get a performance and you get uh, a thing where all the actors do their job perfectly. Mm -hmm. All of the special effects work. And, and yeah, the special effects are cheesy for the time. 
uh, or cheesy for now, but they were pretty good for the time. <coughs> the visuals were stunning, and matte paintings are were industry standard at the time. Yeah, that's just how you did things. So none of it, in particular, the thing the thing is is that and matte painting is a lost art. Um, <clears throat> the these days because it's not a uh, a thing. The the big thing to realize is that a good matte painting makes you believe that it's not a matte painting. Yeah. Um, and th- some examples of that that I gotta give are I I I could be pedantic and of course give things like Return of the Jedi and actually yeah. most Star Wars films where matte paintings were used. Uh, to to wonderful degree, but one thing that I really like to one example I really really love to give is Die Hard Two. Yeah, no, yeah. most of the most of the sequences that take place on the runways of the airport in Die Hard Two were actually filmed in late afternoon, not in the dead of night, because you, it's fucking impossible to film in the dead of night even today. It, you you can yeah. you can light it up all you want and LEDs have made it so you can film later and later. You can do everything, but it's just so hard to get to get good yeah. be, because because film is by its very nature a light sensitive thing to do. You just can't film at night and make things look good. Right. But particularly when you have to film at high speed for action. And keep in mind that Die Hard 2 was also filmed using traditional film. It wasn't done digitally. Because digital filming didn't exist yet. But the matte paintings that were used to establish nighttime in Washington, D.C., particularly when the airport was in the background or when there was a backdrop of the planes landing at the end, those were convincing as hell. So we we established that the parts of this movie are fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with the parts. Like, if you pull it apart and mm-hmm. look at each individual part, the performances, the acting, the special effects, all of it, Sting, Every, because Sting, Sting, is, Sting is, is a wonderful. Is a character. I, I mean, Sting is Sting, and that's Every, just the way it well, is. Well, hell, everything, everything that takes place actually on Arrakis is good. It's good good movie it could be expanded it could be drawn out it's too compressed it's not fit for purpose no but it's good filmmaking the pacing's all right it doesn't lead it it, um it doesn't make every or it doesn't uh it, it 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 feels compressed but it but it still feels like it's a functional film in there and that where where this movie goes off the rails is that first third leading up to it and then everything after the invasion of Arrakis by the Harkonnens. Yeah, I mean, when you put the whole thing together, it's a worse idea than my first marriage. Um, <laughs> when, I mean, honestly, when you put it all together, it just is... Uh, I mean, it is awful. Um, uh, and uh, it is awful on so many levels um, when it's all together, when it's taken all as a whole. Um, it's creepy in some... like, And not good creepy. It's mm-hmm. creepy. It's rapey, creepy in a bunch of spots that are very uncomfortable. That make that is very uncomfortable, and we're uncomfortable at the time. And that was in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and, and then you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of actors working really hard and getting nowhere, um, and just giving a great performance. It's the exact and getting nothing. It's the exact opposite problem that we have with Batman and Robin, where all the Everything about Batman and Robin was a shit script. Shit script. But I'll tell you, but everyone there in that movie who realized it was a shit script and gave up and ended up turning in some of the best performances of their lives. The only, the only person in that movie who was working too hard and took it too seriously was Alicia Silverstone. Yeah, no, I I will give you that with that one. Mean, um, meanwhile, everyone else were ha- were were in a competition to ham up for the camera, which that and that's the same thing here was that no one the the people who hammed for the camera, uh, were, uh, were the were the two main Harkonnens, the Baron and Fade. 
and and of course uh, and of course Patrick Stewart, but Patrick Stewart at that point had yet to pull the stick out of his ass, uh, which he would later do with uh, Next Generation. But at that point, he was a serious Shakespearean actor, and mm-hmm. so you know he kind of did his thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's one of those things, and and I'm hoping I do have hope because again I'm a huge fan and. Um, I do have hope that this new movie that's going to come out um, will do it justice. And it's one of those things where, which, I, honestly, uh, I've never seen anything that Jason Momoa has done that I did not think was uh, fun and watchable and good. Um, so I have hope. But uh, that being said, I think that uh, it's one of those things that is a very delicate balance. If you take it too seriously, you get what we're talking about right now. You get the movie we're talking about right now. If you mm-hmm. don't take it seriously enough, you get the sci-fi movie, which is... My back teeth are hurting thinking about it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's Why just, do I smell toast and copper? Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> It feels like a stroke just to think about those two. Um, uh, so it's, it's definitely... There is something there that's filmable. There is something there... That is, you can you can put together and make it work. Um, the the question comes in is how do you do it? Um, they, I mean, they obviously failed um, <laughs> with the with the eighty four version. Um, they failed so spectacularly that they succeeded. Um, I think uh, you know they they came out the other side of failure uh, into. Something of a something of a success, although I think uh, calling anything about this movie a success is uh, uh, um, hyperbole at best. Um, but honestly, uh, this movie is bad, <laughs> and I think I think that uh, that's the best that can be said about this movie. <laughs> um, and I would only recommend it to people who. Uh, like myself, are fascinated <laughs> by uh, bad movies and fascinated by such, uh, you know, the hard work that goes into it to turn out and be this friggin' awful um, is, uh, you know, it's a, it's an admirable thing. Because <laughs> uh, you, you watch the dailies, right, when uh-huh. you're doing these things. You watch the dailies, and you gotta know. There, there, there's a point... <laughs> There, there's a point where you can't flip off the shit switch. Exactly. It's there's a point where you have to be. You're no. looking at it. And <laughs> you you going, just gotta you just gotta grab onto the sides of the stall and realize you're in this for the long haul. Exactly. <laughs> and and you're looking at it and you're just going, <sighs> but you have to you have to finish because you're being paid to finish. The studio wants you to finish, and you gotta finish. So I, I feel like they knew, and they know, um, that this is shite um, on so many different levels. But they had the intestinal fortitude, and the, uh, uh, the the really the integrity to go ahead and finish it and put it out there, mm-hmm. and you got to admire um, that kind of integrity, uh, where you know what you made was crap, but <laughs> you put it out there anyways, um, and uh, <laughs> and so at the end of the day. I think that we do not disagree on this film one iota. Um, the difference being, I like it because of all of the shit and crap, and you don't. Um, <laughs> I kind of do, but it is a very, very delicate thing. I gotta be like, like I, I, I did this project because I had a bug up my ass to watch this movie again. Yeah. And, and I had a bug up my ass to watch this movie again because of the, um, how, how, how because of the new film coming out. Right. So it, it was sort of like, oh, hey, sure, let's remind ourselves of this. Um, I don't know if I regret it or not. Uh, but that that's a uh, that that is a discussion for a long you know I, I I need more booze for that so anyway Captain thank you for uh, for coming on and sharing this uh, moment with me we've um, I've got two movies in mind that I'd like to do uh, next the first one is 
uh, the Dungeons and Dragons movie with Jeremy Irons. Oh. Speaking of flipping the shit switch. Yeah. <laughs> and, God. And that just hurts. As, as, a, as a aficionado of Dungeons and Dragons, um, it, it, again, that just hurts. <laughs> But it's, well, but we'll have to talk about that next time. The other one that I'm thinking about doing is the Dolph Lundgren masterpiece, Masters of the Universe. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. Is that, is that the one we're doing next? Yeah, I think that should be the one we do next. <laughs> right. uh, um, just the glory. <laughs> just, just the glory. All right. Next time we will pull out the Buick Slayer and we will review Masters of the Universe. We'll be seeing you, kids. Doses.